coherence, thanks a lot, uh, Milo, and thanks, uh, that's very exciting what's going on, and uh, I look forward to to what is going to be produced. Uh, the It's a big honor also for me to be giving this lecture, so I'm going to talk about um, markets and morality, some work I've been doing with Mathias de Watripon. Um, we are actually undertaking a very major uh, rewriting of uh, of this um, of this uh, paper, so it may it may you may have to wait maybe two or three weeks before getting the new version of the paper, and I apologize for that. Uh, before um, I start on the paper with with Matthias, uh, I would like to have a series of remarks about uh, markets and morality the, to give the general background on those issues. And, you know, as Milo said, you know, feel free to interrupt me. I say, maybe it's a keynote, but I want it to be some kind of uh, seminar or discussion, if you like. Uh, so don't, don't hesitate. So the paper with Matthias re, uh, revisits a nagging question with, is the market weakening or more compass? And that's, of course, an old question. Um, and you see some uh, big divergence, I would say, between the economist and the public opinion or the politicians, the religious leader, and, and I'll come back to that, to philosophers who kind of warn against the uh, religion of the marketplace. Um, we all know that, uh, and we practice those, those narratives ourselves, that there are narratives which basically point the finger at the market for immoral behavior. So, you know, if I sell uh, weapons to an autocratic regime, I will say, well, you know, listen, if I don't sell those weapons, then uh, somebody else will do that. Uh, if I'm a doctor and I sell, you know, I prescribe too many, um, too much anti antibiotics in France or opioids in the US, my excuse will be, that anyway, somebody else will do it otherwise. So I'm not doing any harm really. Um, same thing if I bribe an official in, in the less developed countries, you know, if I don't bribe, somebody else who is bribing will get the contract. Athletes who take performance enhancing drugs have the same reasoning and so on and so forth. So that's called the replacement excuse or the replacement logic and actually this a little bit of evidence pointing in this direction. And we need to collect more evidence. Um, but that raises a big issue is that whether such behaviors under intense competition um, lose their moral overtone and just become part of a uh, cost of doing business. This is very important because if you want to see about, if you want to think about antitrust, for example, uh, should we create monopolies to avoid uh, uh, to avoid uh, having this kind of, of logic. So that's one, one, one thing. Now, um, before, before going on, we have to ask what is moral? And I, will, I think it's fair to say that uh, most economists will think of morality as being a simple externality. So everybody agrees that you know, polluting is not nice or committing a crime is not nice. It's just an externality. It's about harm or pro-social behavior, basically. And this, this idea, I mean, this conception of, uh, of morality is probably the most universal, similar across cu cu culture or stable across time. Uh, I just want to say, you know, it's, it's something I find very appealing, but it's very restrictive uh, for at least two reasons. Uh, the first is that, and I will come back to that at the end, is that lots of experiments have shown our moral behavior is fragile to various uh, narratives and more wiggle room. So there's an entire literature showing that the very flimsy excuses, situational excuses actually uh, release, you, release oneself of one's duty, moral duty. And that's, that's very disturbing somehow that we behave in a more way, but you know, if we have the slightest, slightest excuse, we stop doing so. Um, the other thing um, is that not everybody agrees that moral behavior is about not inflicting harm. So um, 
think about, for example, the book of Jonathan Haidt on the writer's mind. Uh, the idea is that morality is broader than just uh, pro-sociality. Um, it is about not involving no harm to any, anyone, but harm being defined in a broader sense. Uh, so there are behaviors which we think, for example, do not involve any harm to anyone. So for example, sexuality between people of the same sex or different races. And nonetheless, you know, for a fraction of the population that violates the convention, the taboos or generating major disgust or whatever. And, you know, this is very time and, uh, and time contingent. It varies a lot across, uh, across time and across countries. Uh, the other thing is that lots of people, including morality, the sense of duty, the sense of authority, the loyalty to the in-group. So you think about family, workplace, country, religion, and so on. Um, and that's viewed as being something uh, very important. Um, we economists tend to say, well, no, I mean, we don't care about authority per se, for example. So authority may be an instrument to achieve a goal, but authority is not a goal per se. The same thing for duty, same thing for loyalty. Um, people have a, have a broader view. And uh, lo and behold, I mean, this kind of uh, view fluctuates more over time and across cultures, much more than the first view. And of course, you know, the question is then what is meant by harm? So if I disagree with you, am I harming you? You know, and that's, that's, that, that, that's actually a very complex issue. Now, talking about the market, um, the, eco the economist felt on Chown, the worldview, if you want, is that incentives are key. Of course, you know, many of us have worked in the last 30 years about warning that low power incentives or incentives which uh, uh, do not react very much to performance, individual performance may be desirable. Maybe because you have noisy performance measurement, the old Armstrong paper teamwork is a, is a particular case of that. If you have collusion with monitors or capture, if you have repeated interaction, if you have multitask, multitasking, if you have adverse selection, we have written lots of papers saying, you know, you may not want to have iPod incentives. So that's well known. Actually, even you may even have crowding out. So crowding out is basically uh, a downward sloping supply curve. And you know, from, from my work with Roland Benabou, you we know that may arise in two situations. Either the principle is in form and basically high power incentives might destroy intrinsic motivation because it conveys something about the task of the person, or it may be multidimensional signaling, um, what psychologists call the other justification effect, which is that uh, the, uh, you know, if you, if I behave pro-socially, but I'm being paid for it, then you don't know whether I'm doing it because I'm pro-social or because I'm doing it for the money. Um, nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that, um, Economists, we economists, we think that incentives work. I mean, in most circumstances, uh, we have lots of caveats, but you know, by and large, we we want to achieve compliance with contractual incentives, mechanism, mechanism design, and the like. A special case of incentives is markets. And again, the economists have spent, actually, that's much of, of what we are doing as economists to talk about market failures. Yeah. We talk about externalities, we talk about internalities, the fact that we may not stand for our own best interests, market power, asymmetric information, inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we, again, we have all those caveats and we say, no, no, that market is very important because markets are efficient. So what we must do is actually regulate the market as best as we, as we can. Um, Psycho, I mean, the social scientists have a slightly different view. I mean, some of, some of that is addressed, of course, in our own research. So, for example, psychologists and sociologists will say material incentives don't always work well. They may undermine intrinsic motivation. They may crowd out such valuable social norms. Okay, so that's something we have taken more and more on board. Same thing, legal scholars say that the law is not just a set of incentive and sanction, but it's also expressive in the sense that it's going to reflect 
societal value. So it's not just about a price, you know, uh, punishing you for a crime or something like that. It's also something about uh, society's value. That again, you know, we, we can account for that in our frameworks. Um, I guess where there's the most disagreement in practice will be with some philosophers. So they have a very, some of them have a very strong distrust of markets or at least some markets. And we may not disagree with them, but maybe, and I, I should say right away is that if you look at the philosophers and they're also very heterogeneous, they often have the same starting point, often the same title, almost the same title for their book. And maybe some, even the same conclusion, but they they reach that conclusion from very different perspectives. So two extreme cases might be Michael Sandel in his bestseller, What Money Can Buy, but also Debra Stats at Stanford has written an interesting book on, on that. But you know, I could I could also mention is that Anderson, Michael Welser, and so on. But many, many philosophers have, have written books which which have a title like this. And that raises a question for us economists. You know, is economists a moral and philosophical science? And you know that's that's very important because you know um, we believe it, or at least we want to believe it, and that's important. So let me before I talk about the uh, the paper with Matthias, uh, let me make a few more remarks. Um, and the first one oversimplifies by a large amount. Uh, our society is something uh, like of a mixture of Smiths and Pigou. So um, on the one hand, we want to have the invisible end of the market to uh, get market efficiency. And it's clear that markets have done wonders in many countries. And we see that now with, with uh, poor countries having developed remarkably. Um, at the same time, we also emphasize that markets fail usually. I mean, climate is the worst example, but yeah. There are many, many other very important examples. Uh, the markets fail, and you know, basically the conception is that you know you will use a market and the state is there to correct market failure. Um, but that raises the, the issue of why we have a social responsibility. And you know, the answer is simply that not only the market fails, but the governments fail as well, and as badly as the markets, for all the reasons we know, uh, capture, pandering. Um, maybe things happen abroad and we cannot just invade China because China is, in, is using coal, right? I mean, this does, it will not make any sense. Um, but also there are transaction costs, there are many other things that, that raise issues. Now, maybe in defense, I mean, maybe that was, you know, of, of our profession, you know, I, I try in economics for the common good to, really to say that the number of what we call repugnant market can be analyzed very simply in terms of very familiar concepts like externalities, including image externalities, internalities, non-competitive market, asymmetric information, inequality, motivated beliefs, and, and so on. So in a sense, we have the tools actually to, um, to analyze those rep repugnant market. And why is that important? Well, I don't like indignation. I mean, <laughs> let me explain. I mean, I think moral postures are very unreliable sources of physical inspiration. We have seen too often in the past people saying, the majority of people saying, this behavior is disgusting, it's immoral. When you, it's not clear, it's immoral at all. So I don't like moral postures. I don't like indignation. Indignation, may, being indignant, uh, may serve a purpose. So, I mean, because it's a warning signal that there might be something wrong. Um, so I see being indignant about something as a warning signal, but that's, that's about it, no more. Because what we need to do is to try to understand why we don't like those markets or why we have concerns about those markets. Should we regulate them? Should we private them? What should we do? Should we just let them happen? Um, you know, this is a kind of thing we have to go through and just say, don't, don't content yourself with saying, I don't like that. You know, I don't think it's, it's a scientific posture. Um, we need actually to, to actually do better. So um, there are also another issue which I'm not going to, to touch on is that if we, even if we don't like markets, we have to think about what the counterfactual to the market is. And there are some interesting counterfactuals, there are some awful counterfactuals. You know, if you want to, 
to actually uh, uh, there is always market. The point, my point here is that markets always exist, whether we like them or not. So the question is, you know, how do you want to organize them and regulate them? And that's basically uh, an interesting thing. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. Let me let me see if there is any question first. And again, you know, feel free, feel entire, entirely free to actually interrupt. No, <laughs> okay. Um, I guess this one, the presentation of the paper is going to raise more questions and including clarifying questions. So Matthias and I have been working on the monetary markets. Again, um, the new version of the paper will be ready only in, in two or three weeks and I apologize for that. Um, the, you know, what we ask in a sense is how is our moral behavior affected by competition? And should we restrict competition in order to get better moral behavior? Um, now, we IO economists, of course, are, are used to thinking about competition as a market structure, the number of firms, their substitutability, and that's perfectly, perfectly fine, but uh, we are going to take a broader perspective because you know, we are going to ask, how do firms compete, for example? Something that will play a role, for example, is whether prices are flexible or fixed. You're going to tell me in general, you know, in markets, prices are, are flexible. And that's true to a large extent, but not always. And if you think about professions, you know, the price of taxi rides is regulated. Uh, in many countries, the price of, of doctors is regulated or not raised. Uh, in two-sided markets, platforms, you know, apps and franchising on apps are constrained to price to charge at zero or bound. I mean, we get lots of service at price zero. So that's, uh, that's basically a fixed price, zero. Um, franchising environment, same thing. The price is often, uh, is often, um, often regulated and so on. Uh, so there are lots of examples where actually prices are fixed. And this is going to make a difference. Something which is also going to make a difference is if you behave immorally. So if you, by the way, I'm going to use ethical behavior and moral behavior with exactly the same meaning, you know, just to simplify it. Um, cutting ethical corner may help you increase your profits. Uh, it's not interesting. I mean, I, do, I don't know if anyone who will actually behave immorally to reduce is our profit. This doesn't make sense, right? Um, so in general, cutting ethical corner is about increasing profit. It can either lower costs or boost demand, okay? So for example, um, cost reduction might be I use fossil fuel and I pollute when I produce, or I use child labor in, in a less developed country. My costs are smaller that way. Um, I'm going to give you examples. And actually, the examples I gave you earlier are about boosting demand. So it's more likely that I get, uh, as I'm selling, if I pay a bribe or, or uh, you know, if I, if I cut various ethical corners to boost the demand. So, it, you know, if I prescribe antibiotics, then it's more likely that the patient will come back to me. Or if I prescribe osteopurates, uh, if, um, you know, if I'm, uh, if I engage in sports and, you know, I take performance enhancing drug, it's more likely that, of course, I'll be invited and I'll get, I'll get, uh, I'll get money out of it and so on. So that's one thing. And that's, as we were to say, it's going to play a role with actually cutting in secret corners, uh, lower costs or boost demand. I mean, you might imagine that competition is going to have bigger effect when it boosts demand, right? Um, the social responsibility of stakeholders is important. So we will allow for not only the firm to have uh, ethical concern, but also the stakeholders of the firm. So think about investors, think about workers or consumers. Um, 
And then we will be asking, what about heterogeneity in the industry? So it may be the case that you're in an industry with uh, people with high ethical concerns and some people are, are less ethical. Or something we'll be interested in as well is whether you're for-profit and not for-profit um, corporations in the industry. And, and we have to ask, you know, do less ethical supplier drive out uh, of the markets, ethical one, so that might be some kind of Gresham slow uh, of ethical behavior. And similarly, what's going to happen with nonprofits when they are in a market where in which I compete with for profit? So that's the kind of question we're going to ask. So let me describe the model, unless you unless you have questions. Okay, so we are going to consider an oligopoly with N competing firms. Um, this serves say unit demand consumers, a continuum of unit demand consumers. A firm is going to choose a price, PI, but it's also going to choose, there will be a second dimension in the choice, which will be the moral action. So we'll call AI the action. Um, so higher AI will be a more moral action. So AI will belong to some interval zero AI hat. AI hat can be finite or infinite. In, in the number of examples we develop in the paper, it will be finite, but it doesn't matter. Um, but the important thing is that if you have a consumer who comes to you and buys from you, and you have chosen the moral action AI, um, then that's going to generate social welfare WI of AI. So for example, if uh, you know, I'm producing electricity or whatever good, um, basically I'm going to choose how much pollution I exert. And depending on the level of pollution, you know, what kind of uh, technology I use, then there will be a different social welfare. So if I pollute less, then I will get higher WI. So think of WI as being the externality of society, for example. But there will be other interpretations I will come back to. So the welfare impact WI of AI is going to satisfy, you know, it's going to be a, an increasing function. It will be concave and with visual properties, okay? Um, the more action may also affect unit cost. Remember, um, you know, the, it might be, for example, that if I employ child labor uh, used for fossil fuels, it will be cheaper for me to produce and therefore my cost will be increasing in the morality of the action. But you could also have the reverse case. So imagine that I behave morally. Then if I have socially responsible investor or socially responsible workers, those investors or the workers, they will be willing to, to accept a lower return or lower wage in order to be able to be associated with my firm. In that case, when I behave more morally, I actually reduce my cost, okay? I reduce my cost in that case. Um, but often you have both, right? I mean, you know, in general, you, uh, so we're just going to assume that C prime I can be positive or negative, but it's going to be convex. That's the important thing because otherwise we don't get concavity, okay? Now, something which is going to play a big role in what follows is the concept of a net price. So I told you that um, the moral action can actually impact demand. Those were the example I gave you on the first slide of, on the paper with my class. So if I behave morally, um, then basically I'm reducing the utility of, of the person I'm interacting with. And it's as if I was increasing the price. So I'm going to call phi i of AI. The, the increase in price uh, relative to, you know, when I increase in the morality of my action, I displease that particular consumer. And therefore, it's as if uh, this consumer were paying a higher net price. Okay. So that's, that's very natural. And the demand function, my demand function as from I will depend on my net price and the vector 
of net prices chart by the other, other firms, P minus I hat. Okay. So, you know, so basically, whether I will get the contract will depend on many things, but will also depend on whether, you know, the size of the bribe I give to the official and also the size of the bribes which are offered by the other firms. Um, the elasticity of demand DI will depend on the standard IO considerations, the number of firms, the suitability among products. Uh, in general, we can index it by a parameter sigma, which is going to, to be basically an intensity of competition. So it could be the inverse of the, of the transportation cost in the hoteling model, for example. So sigma could be the inverse, but in, in general, it's going to be um, uh, a parameter which is going to index the intensity of competition. And the elasticity of demand is defined in the standard way, which is uh, yeah, minus DDI or DPI or DI of PI. Now, the assumption we make is not very strong, which is basically is that if price is higher, then the elasticity of demand is smaller. I mean, that's standard assumption to make. Uh, see, so if prices are low, then you, you get into a region where the elasticity of demand is very high. Okay. Uh, so let me yes. So let me get back um, on the net price. Um, you you have yeah okay here is there there are three cases you can consider. So the first case is the first case is the one I already mentioned, which I will call. I mean, you may not like this terminology, but. The, um, I will call socially responsible consumer. So you can, for example, form normalize fi of AI equals AI. But the important thing is that when you behave more morally, they don't like it. They are less likely to purchase, right? Um, so that's uh, the consumers we are talking about. But there might be other consumers. So, so for example, I may be paying bribes uh, uh, in some other country, but then for my other product or what I produce with my inputs, uh, there will be socially responsible consumer in my country who will be upset. So the difference between a socially irresponsible consumer and a socially responsible consumer is that the net price is increasing in the moral action in the first case and decreasing with the moral action in the second case. So you might think of alpha C as being the internalized. That's, that's just an example. It doesn't have to be that, by the way. But, you know, for example, you might internalize the welfare that you, you create by buying from this firm and alpha C is the internalization of welfare. And then you have, you know, homo economicus that just don't care. The consumers basically care just about the price. Okay. So still no questions? No? Okay. So <clears throat> why is that a more issue? So... In the paper, we derive um, three foundations for demand side benefits, <clears throat> excuse me, of cutting ethical corners, um, meaning that there are irresponsible consumers. The first is the externality. So, you know, if I sell weapons to a dictator, for example, or if I bribe an official, or I take a performance en en enhancing drugs and I'm hurting other people. It could be an internality, that the case of uh, opioids, the case of, of antibiotics is, uh, is an externality. And then there's something a bit more subtle, but uh, basically a product misrepresentation, shrouded attributes, and so on. Um, so think about uh, un, you know, lying or not disclosing fat, fat and, or sugar content, uh, selling financial toxic financial products without saying they are toxic, so short-termism, income manipulation, and so on. I mean, you, you, you need to, to address the terminology sometimes, but mathematically, it's exactly the same as an internality or an externality. Now, the example of a responsible consumer so will be someone who wants to engage in fair trade. So I want my coffee to be, to be a fair trade coffee. Okay, so here, a little bit more mathematics. Jean, uh, I mm -hmm. have a question. Sure. Uh, is it not enough to have the uh, homo economicus? Why do you need people uh, 
because the price will be lower with all this uh, cutting corner. So why why do you need people to to like? The, because because you because you have two uh, uh, two ways in which you can gain from unethical behavior. The first is what you have in mind right now, which is you you cut on costs. So I, you you use child labor; it's cheaper. Okay, uh, but the other thing is that you please the particular person you are dealing with in order to get his or her business. Um, that's the case of opioids or weapons or, or whatever. Uh, so in that case, it's a demand side benefit of cutting a single color. Whereas what you had in mind is um, the cost side benefit of cutting, cutting a single color. And you'll see, I mean, that, that makes a difference in the treatment. I mean, the cost in a sense, you know, the intuition is that cost side um, the demand, the demand function doesn't really matter for the cost side. Whereas for the demand side, you know, that's a replacement logic that I was talking about at the beginning. If, if you have very intense competition, then if you don't do it, somebody, somebody else will. Okay, so that's very important to actually add more behavior into the demand function as well, and not only into the cost function. Maybe it's going to, uh, Emmanuel is going to come a, become a bit clearer when I describe the, the pair of functions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the pair of function of uh, manager I, or entrepreneur I, or firm I, um, will be startup profit. So it will be price minus cost. Remember the, the cost depend on, um, on the ethical behavior. It could be increasing or decreasing. And it's going to depend on the price on the demand function, which is going to depend on the net prices. Now, this is a little bit less obvious. So basically the assumption is that the firms have social preferences. Uh, that means that they will internalize welfare and and we have to discuss exactly what what we mean by that but alpha i will be the standard social preference parameter and there will be some kind of internalization of welfare and we are going to assume that supplier i internalize a function w script of p hat and a okay okay so those are vectors right because you know, it's going to depend on the vector of net prices if only because it depends on demand but it's also going to depend on more behaviors by the various the suppliers. So examples, so we actually, this formalism allows for a number of examples. So one of them is WI of P at and A is equal to the sum of WI DI or DJ, WJ DJ, right? So basically, um, this is a number of units, so DI is a number of units sold by Firm I and WI is societal impact of that. So it could be, for example, this term, this overall term might be total pollution. So, you know, there, there are DI which choose supply I, and then that creates a damage from pollution, WI of AI per consumer. Or it could be total consumption of opioids. Okay. Now, in general, in general, it's not going to be full welfare because, in general, um, you may also have a misallocation cost. So basically the matching, I mean, think about an hoteling model, for example, if, uh, if one of the producers behave more immorally and attracts more consumers, that means that they will be also, if they are otherwise symmetrical, that there will be basically a misallocation of consumers to firms in this hoteling model. So there is a misallocation cost, which will depend, and it should depend only on the vector of net prices because that that's relates to the misallocation of consumers. Now it turns out, and this is a result at the bottom of, uh, of the page, we have a result which says, if you look at symmetric equilibria of symmetric oligopolies, then those the symmetric equilibria when suppliers inter internalize ethical welfare, are also symmetric equilibria when they internalize full welfare. Why? Because I mean, the proof is, is a one line proof, which is that if you have a symmetric equilibrium, 
then there won't be any misallocation in a symmetric environment. And therefore, if you deviate, you are going to create a misallocation. So that's going to make deviations even less appealing. And therefore, an equilibrium in which there is ethical welfare internalization is also an equilibrium when there is full welfare internalization. But conversely, you could, you could also look at an, a narrower ethical welfare. So you might say, oh, I'm a, as a consumer or I'm, I'm a supplier, I don't really care about what the other people do. I just care about you know the morality of my actions. So you know it's this term is really a subset of, of, of the total term. So I care about my own pollution. You know, I'm not it's not it's not a normative point of view. I just describe how they, they perceive the welfare. Now you need an assumption, and that's that's a very important assumption. So this assumption really says that the perception of welfare when um, more action of uh, supplier I changes is proportional to demand, okay? And this is very natural. This is, it's really consequentialist, okay? Because in the end, when there's a change in, in moral behavior, then, uh, then there is, uh, there is it's going to be proportional to demand, right? The impact is going to be proportional to demand. So this is really a, an assumption about consequentialism, and that's going to be important. Now, this function is going to be decreasing some, simply because of concavity, right? So that, and that's, by the way, those, this assumption is satisfied in all the, all the examples we develop in the paper, externality, internality, product misrepresentation, that works. Okay, so it looks like a very strong assumption, but it, first it's natural and also it's satisfied in all the examples we have developed. Okay, so go back to uh, the startup complaint about markets. The startup complaints about markets is that competition is going to erode more behavior. Okay, is that correct? Is that correct? And we, we first say, well, that's not obvious at all. Actually, we have a very general result, which tells you that that's not the case. So the question we ask, does an increase in elasticity of demand, either because there are entry of new firm or an increase in suitability? So imagine that the, the T parameter of the hoteling model goes down or sigma goes up. Um, does it result in less moral behavior? And the result we get is that it has absolutely no impact whatsoever. Competitive pressure, you know, is you know the something that changes the elasticity of demand, of individual demand, has absolutely no impact on more choices in equilibrium. If either prices are flexible or they are fixed, but more action affects the cost. So that's a child labor example, but not demand. Okay. So I have to, so I'm just going to look at part A, which is if you have flexible prices, then the intensity of competition just doesn't matter. And therefore, if you believe that, we should not relax antitrust and we should not create monopolies to get good behavior. Actually, a monopoly or cartel doesn't behave better than a very competitive industry. What is intuition? So I'm going to develop it just for flexible prices. Um, so imagine that you have demand side benefits of cutting ethical corners. So basically, when you choose AI smaller, you face a higher demand. Okay, and consider an increase in elasticity of demand. Then cutting a single corner is going to, and that's really the replacement logic. You know, if you cut a single corner, you attract more consumers and that's going to lead to higher increase in market share. It's very tempting, you know, you, you, you get higher increase in market share by behaving immorally. So that's exactly in a sense what 
the replacement logic of the philosophers are saying. At the same time, there is a contravening force, which is that if there is more competition, there is a lower markup. And if there is a lower markup, there is a lower gain, actually, of gaining market share, and therefore there is a lower gain in uh, behaving immorally. And it turns out because of uh, the additivity structure of the uh, net price uh, formula, the two effects perfectly offset each other. Okay, so that really already tells you something about, well, you should be careful before saying that markets destroy cyclical behavior. And actually, when we relax those assumptions, sometimes we will find it still doesn't have any inf in impact or we find that it's going to destroy more behavior and sometimes we'll find it actually improves more behavior. Um, so, so the question then is, when does competitive pressure matter? The first, I mean, basically this results suggests the answer, which is, you know, if you have flexible prices, it's irrelevant. Competitive pressure is irrelevant. So it's, it's a modically any Miller result. <laughs> Uh, the, if you have fixed prices, obviously you get rid of the reduced markup effect of intense competition, okay? And what we get is that if you have irresponsible consumers, so that basically immoral behavior is going to increase demand, then more competition is going to impede more behavior because you do have you, you do have uh, the replacement logic. If I don't do it, someone else will. Um, and we show that actually more choices are strategic complements for a variety of reasons. The first is the elasticity of effect, which is if the rivals behave immorally, that intensifies the competition, and therefore that raises the firm's elastic demand, and therefore that pushes oneself to actually reduce uh, one's moral behavior. behavior. This, uh, there are also effects which are actually uh, interesting and which go in the same direction. And let me just mention the social responsibility effect. Um, if the other firms behave immorally, then um, it's very important to take market share away from them. So you're going to behave more less morally yourself, actually. So, you know, that's part of your social responsibility. Take market share away from rivals while still being more moral than they are. Um, but at the bottom of the page, there is some very important result as well, which is if instead of having irresponsible consumers who have responsible consumers, then that's going to be the mirror image. So more competition is actually going to foster more, more behavior. For responsible consumers, you know, people who want to engage in fair trade, for example, or, or, or something like that, um, they, they actually, uh, if you behave morally, then you're going to attract more consumers. And if there is more competition, the SSD is going to be higher. And therefore, more competition is going to allow consumers to choose someone who is ethical. So it is just complete reversal of the standard conventional wisdom. The, uh, this conventional wisdom, you know, replacement logic and the philosopher's logic is very much a first result here, but it's confined to fixed prices. And if you have responsible consumer, you get exactly the reverse result. Okay. You have questions? I should leave a little bit of time for q and I guess, but um, I'm just going to give you some, uh, Sophie, you have some question? Uh, yes, uh, Jean, thank you very much. Um, on the flexible price, I had some, some difficulties reconciling that with uh, the notion of uh, no Nash, uh, Nash competition uh, in an oligopoly. Yeah. Uh, because I, it seemed to me that if you if you have fewer uh, firms, then the, the you know, Nash competition may induce them to uh, to play the the bad equilibrium. So uh, this is um, 
this is just a static Nash equilibrium here. So we look at the equilibrium in which uh, they the optimize. Now they could collude. Um, I guess that's what you have in mind. So that if it's a repeated game, so each player they charge a price and they choose some more behavior, they might collude on that. And they might reach a monopoly outcome, for example. But this result tells you that the cartel or the monopoly outcome is exactly the same as a competitive outcome in terms of morality. Of course, the prices are lower if you have competition than if you have a monopoly or a cartel. But in terms of morality, it's exactly the same morality in both cases. So, you know, you can have as much collusion as you want. You are going, still going to get the same level of morality. Now you you may still want to in, you still want to have antitrust because antitrust will allow you to have lower prices. That's a different ball game. But you know, in t- you cannot. What I'm saying is that one cannot use just uh, this argument about the replacement logic to basically change antitrust. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just be very brief, and then we can have a chat about what, what we are doing. So um, we are, the last, not quite the last thing we do, but you know, thing, something we do is that uh, uh, we have a bunch of results I'm not going to present on symmetric oligopoly. But there is also, you know, an asymmetric oligopoly framework for various reasons. One reason is that, as I mentioned, people have different ethics. So they might differ on, on, the, on their ethical stance. So we, we, we capture that by saying people have different, uh, different alpha i, so they have different internalization of welfare. The other possibility is that they have different corporate forms. So we are going to allow, we are actually going to allow both in the same model. Uh, so we, there will be an heterogeneity in terms of uh, alpha i, which is how much you internalize social welfare or your conception of social welfare. It could be ethical welfare, it could be uh, full welfare, or it could be narrow welfare. It doesn't matter. But also um, in terms of corporate form. So you could have for profit and not for profit. We are going to keep, we have two levels, of, two degrees of heterogeneity. We are going to keep the rest symmetrical. So the demand curve otherwise is same. So it's a symmetrical demand curve. It's a symmetrical cost function. We are going to assume, you remember the relevance result is that when prices are flexible, then, um, Market structure is irrelevant. The intensity of competition is completely irrelevant to moral behavior. Now, I told you that's not true if you have fixed prices. Here, we are going to look at something which formally is a flexible price, but de facto will be a fixed price in part. So we are going to assume that prices are endogenous, they're not fixed. But at the same time, um, either big, either because of the difference in, uh, in ethics or the dependent corporate form, then there will be uh, something akin to a fixed price. And it's clear for not-for-profit. A pro- for, not-for-profit has to charge a price which is equal to cost. Okay. But also when there is a heterogeneity in alpha i, the highly ethical uh, suppliers that tend to actually make very low profits that we, we can show. And you know, at some point, if they have to break even, then they become not for profit. They are not formally for profit, but they are so ethical that actually they are going to, uh, to face the break even constraint. And if they have to, to break even, then they will, uh, they will become de facto, not de jure, but de facto for profit, not for profit. So what we do is to characterize the equilibrium. Again, there's symmetry in demand and cost. It's only in terms of preferences or corporate form that there is an asymmetry. So basically, there will be three groups of firm in the industry. I mean, they are not always, there may be, some group may be empty, but you know, by and large, you have three groups. And I've ranked them through 
increasing morality in equilibrium AI. So the less moral firm will be the for-profits, which are not constrained. And actually, they will be the one with the lowest morality. So I'm going to rank alpha I. Alpha one is less than alpha two, less than alpha M, less than alpha N1. Okay, so I rank the alphas that, that way. And basically, the one who has a very low alpha, alpha one, is going to be the one who is going to be, so internalize welfare the least and is going to behave the least morally. And then alpha two and then alpha M. There will be a second group of for profits, but those for profits, they are more ethical and, then, and they are going to be bound by the break even constraint. Okay. Otherwise, they will go bankrupt. And this group actually, even so they are for profit, they behave like not for profit. And finally, there is um, the not for profit. And notice I haven't written what the alpha is because it doesn't matter. I mean, just maybe, maybe I should go back to this. I mean, look at this uh, objective function. If you are not for if you are not for profit, pi is equal to ci, so that's equal to zero. Pi equals ci of ai. So you are just left with this, and your alpha doesn't matter as long as it's positive. Okay, so. That's why I didn't rank in that uh, diagram. I didn't rank the, the not-for-profit in terms of ethical behavior. Okay, so that's that's a characterization. Now, the interesting result is this: um, there is a convergence when sigma grows becomes large, or so when there is very intense competition. Then the for-profit will have to mimic the not-for-profit's low price, so they will charge something close to marginal cost. That will happen anyway with only, only for-profits, right? So you will end up with basically something close to marginal cost pricing. But on the other hand, um, they are all going to mimic in the limit the least ethical firm the least ethical for profit. So that, that was one, I know that's the one by, by normalization, I choose supplier one to be the one with the least morality. So basically the story is of course, they're not for profit. They would like to, uh, to improve social welfare, but they can because they're going to lose all their customers if, if you have demand base, uh, if you have a demand base benefits from, uh, cutting ethical corners. So when sigma goes to infinity, then basically all firms are going to be the same, okay? And they are going to be very competitive with very low prices, but they are also going to be even, behave unethically. And that's, that's, that's of course an issue. And that means actually that if you really want to get the benefit for not for, from not for profits, like in the hospital sector or the air, of the education sector, you don't want them to be competing with for profits necessarily. Okay, so that's what that would be the thing. Um, yeah, I think Milo, I guess I should. Yeah, uh, so I was maybe. Yeah, just a, a, last, a last thing I want to say is that when you look at the examples in the real world, some, uh, for some of them, the other, there is a relevance of competition, but some for some of them, which doesn't mean by the way, it's more or any size. But you know, if you have a consequentialist perspective, um, there is actually importance of competition, but there are cases in which that, that's not the case and more wiggle room. So it's just an excuse, it's not a logic. Um, so think about bribing an official. So the contractor or the bidder uh, then picks a price, which is a bid and a bribe. Um, which means that prices are flexible in that case. And, and then if they invoke the replacement issues, then that means that it's really more rigorous. So there's a lot of fun pickle work to be done on that. And I guess I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much, of course, for, for doing this. And I look forward to your, to your questions and to the discussion. So thanks a lot, uh, Jean. Um... We have time for, for a few questions. Uh, don't hesitate to.
intervene or raise your hand? Would I? Please. Thank you. So, so, John, that was a really nice talk. I was curious about what are some of the policy implications of your work? Is it possible for the, the for the planner to directly regulate some level of this action AI? Or is there a role for information or persuasion in trying to convince consumers to be more socially responsible or perhaps sometimes even less uh, responsible? Uh, yeah, would I? That's a, that's a good question. And the, it gets back to the first part of the of the talk, in a sense, which is um, why is there a failure of regulation, right? You know, you might say, okay, well, why do we care about social responsibility? The government is there to regulate and have a decent carbon price, right? You know, that's what that's what we will be saying, right? And, and then our social responsibility will become much less important because the government will be doing the right thing. Um, so basically, we are looking at situations. And, and you know, again, if you look at the philosophers complain about economics, the, those are situations in which you know, the regulation doesn't work well. You know, there are markets for kidneys and they're unregulated or, or whatever. And, and there, there, are, there, are, there are things like, like that where we feel we have a social responsibility maybe to behave properly. Um, and that's the kind of environment we look at. And I guess many people also they may not say so is that you know we'll, we'll, we'll infer we we'll need less we should have less competition. You know, this obsession of economists with competition, you know, I'm one of those who right, who is actually obsessed with competition. Uh, this obsession of, of economists with competition. If you believe in the replacement logic, which which is a reasonable thing, um, it tells you that probably you should uh, you should have less competition and let people call you to maybe have a monopoly, a state monopoly, or something like that. Um, and what we say is that it's much more complicated. You know, there are a bunch of environments where. It's not like everything goes, but you know, there are a bunch of environments where it really doesn't matter. The, the level of competition should not matter. There are environments which are well defined in which actually people are right in saying your know, competition is going to trigger immoral behavior. And there are environments in which you know, actually competition is going to foster pro social behaviors. So, so, you know, that, that's the kind of thing. And the last uh, warning I issued. I don't know how much I believe in it, but you know, it's uh, at least on, from the point of view of the theory, uh, the idea is that if you really want, um, say, healthcare or education to be done by non-for-profit, you have to pay attention uh, to to competition, or else you have to regulate well, right? because that's an alternative. Either you you try to induce more behavior, or you you do your job as a regulator, basically. I see Marcel is, is raising the hand. Yeah, um, uh, just a quick question uh, regarding child labor. So first case of uh, what seemed appear, uh, at least appear in your talk as the uh, one of the worst unethical behavior is to use child labor to reduce your costs. Now child labor is a little bit more complex because if you see it from the point of view of the child or the family or the underdeveloped country, Child labor may be welfare enhancing because it takes the kids away from the street. And um, I remember a report by um, a, an ONG, I mean, uh, many years ago, saying that uh, uh, those uh, actions against, for instance, Nike, which uh, prote protested uh, in Western countries uh, against Nike using child labor, um, a detrimental effect on the welfare of those children and their families. So in a sense, I mean, we have to be a bit careful in, in assessing the welfare aspects of behavior from the point of view of child labor in France or Canada, which is not the case if you talk about child labor in uh, very poor countries. Well, that's, that's a, good, uh, a good comment. Uh... That's why also I want to keep the perception of social welfare very large. 
I just don't want to. I mean, I still need, need, we still need some structure in a sense. You know, the, the, the two assumptions I gave you on the elasticity of demand and uh, on consequentialism. But uh, in general, uh, you want to have a very broad view, vision of social welfare. And that's, that's connected to, to, to something uh, which is important is how do, we, uh, how do we think about morality in those markets and the impact that we have let me give you another example that you are familiar with is uh, leakage in, you know, environmental behavior. So, you know, I might think that by divesting from oil, uh, I'm going to have a big impact. Now, probably uh, my impact will be smaller than, uh, than I think because uh, the shares are going to be purchased by somebody else. Or same thing when you talk about exclusion versus best in class and so on. Those are very difficult issues. And, and you know, child labor, there's, yeah, of course the children are exploited by their parents um, because they don't decide themselves. It's very, it's, very, it's very immoral, but at the same time, as you say, there are also, if you stop child labor, there are also uh, some bad consequences. So, so it's actually much more complicated uh, than, than you say, than, than I said, but uh, in the end, you know, I'd, Again, you know, the question is, you know, I just want to have a very broad assumption about what's internalized. And that may not be what you or I think is the right social welfare function. That's okay. Um, but of course, when we think about intervening, like, you know, Uday's question earlier, uh, you know, should we, for example, kill competition? Um, then we, we need to have our own social welfare function and decide whether child labor is, is good or bad, right, socially, independently of what, be, what people believe.